righty. Well, welcome everyone to Cisco Cast Virtual Kitchen. Today's a great subject that you saw in our opening ad today about hiring tips and really around labor. There's so many questions on what we're dealing with right now, but we've got awesome guests in the house or virtually house, virtual kitchen. I think that's right. Anyways, Andrew Scott, Camille Sue from South, way down in South Virginia, right? Yep. Did I do that right? Okay, yeah. cool. I just want to make sure don't get north and south wrong. <laughs> um, and Andrew, you're out in you're out east. Well, I mean, east being Ottawa, so the capital, if you want to call that east, but uh, that works, that but works. yeah, capital of Canada. Cool. Andrew, you're the like, are you the owner or CEO of Owner Shift Trainer? Well, yeah, a little bit of both, actually. So <laughs> it's uh, yeah, it's it's been my brainchild. Um, for those who don't know me, I've started in the restaurant industry. Oh, goodness, back in 2007 when I was 20 and knew everything. And I learned a lot of lessons along the way. I scaled up to four locations, um, tripled sales at my first location, did a lot of those things and expanded and eventually realized that there's a lot of things that I learned over 14 years and mistakes that I made that I could help other restaurant owners with to basically scale much faster, more profitably, um, and with less stress. So I've kind of shifted into that while still owning my restaurants as well. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of my my focus now. So that's, that's why I'm here. Camille, you're down south and you own an awesome bakery. Tell us a little bit about that before we get into this whole subject. Yeah. Um, so I didn't start the bakery. I actually took it over about two and a half years ago. Um, worked there and then the owner was just like, I don't want to do this anymore. So um, I've been working on improving it and just, you know, trying to actually run it as a business. Um, but we work on, you know, we have retail items like cupcakes and cookies and cannolis that you can purchase right as you walk in. Um, but we also do specialty occasion cakes. So if somebody wants a crazy cake shaped like a dog or a pineapple or anything that they can come up with, that's what we do. Nice. Nice. And this past year has been kind of crazy, I'm assuming. Yes, yes, it has. We've had ups and downs, but thankfully we've stayed pretty busy with support of our community. So that's awesome. Yeah, we've heard that a lot. And I think that's such a great thing is the community's really got behind. And that's probably the silver lining, if there's any within our industry around this, is the attention that it's really brought community on supporting us. And it's awesome to hear that. Yeah. So Roger, let's talk, let's like let's talk labor hiring, however you want to call it. Let's get into it. Let's let's right. talk about this. So I've got a million questions and we want to make sure our, the people that are going to be joining us today, you have the ability to ask us questions, throw comments up there and we'll try to answer them. Um, and uh, we'll go from there, but over to you, Andrew. Okay, perfect. So to make a short story boring, it is the one of the most challenging periods that we've ever experienced um, in hiring. And so what I've been finding through people I talk to worldwide, everyone is struggling hiring right now. And there's a few different reasons for that. Um, number one, there are people that are out of the labor market because they are scared. They could be immunocompromised. They could have family members that, um, you know, are high risk. So therefore they're, they're trying to stay home more. They're not in the job market as much. Uh, we hear all the time about the different unemployment supports that are there. So therefore people, because there are unemployment supports available, they might be less um, motivated to work. And so what this has, do has done, especially coming into spring with restrictions lessening, um, weather getting nicer, a lot of those things happening, it has created um, basically like a Pandora's box of, of hiring where just everything wrong you can imagine is happening right now because April is a tough month for hiring anyway, particularly in Canada when sales start to trend up and mm -hmm. university students and everyone in that age is a lot of you know change over there. It's normally a tough month. Uh, April and September are usually the two toughest months of the year. But compound that with fewer people in the job market, compound that with unemployment supports, and combine that with everything else that's going on, um, it has actually made it very, very difficult. And uh, I've heard of some locations in the US only opening a few days a week or shrinking their hours from you know, down to four hours a week or whatever they actually have the staff to be able to manage. So that's the situation that we're coming into. And so what everyone's wondering is, well, what do I what do I do about it? How do I how do I navigate through this? Because it is probably the worst hiring time that we will ever see in our lives. That's the way I'm looking at it. And it's kind of hard in a sense to even believe this is what we're seeing right now with all these closures. 
is that something that people need to just kind of look at? Like what's today is not really what tomorrow is going to look like. Yeah. And you know what? Um, it, it's so funny because I talk to a lot of my clients and even my own management team and so on. I say the reality of today, um, you know, is today, but we have to look at what's happening six, eight weeks from now, because any decision we make, it takes time to, to go out there. So um, we have to be looking at the future right now, because if you plan your business on what happened, what happened today, you're always going to be behind the eight ball. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's something I think a lot of people in the States probably weren't anticipating in a sense, yeah. right? However, I, I was telling everyone back in January and February, I remember this, saying, okay, guys, we need to start thinking about hiring. We need to focus on hiring now. It is coming. It is coming. And, uh, and it's so funny. I actually have a text message from one of my one of my clients, and she texted me. She said, Andrew, I, I hate messaging you this, but you were right, and I didn't listen. And now <laughs> I'm in a really tough position, and I'm working 80 hours a week because I didn't hire when you told me to, and uh, which is really unfortunate because there are patterns. Yes, COVID and all this other stuff has exacerbated these issues, but there are patterns seasonally that our businesses have, but often we're so into the business, so close to it, that we don't recognize the patterns that are right in front of us. Now, can you kind of explain some of those patterns for yep. us? Um, well, speaking from the Canadian market, um, we know that winter is winter. Winter is cold. Uh, people don't want to go outside. So we know that that is usually uh, December, you know, January. Those are usually slower months for us, February as well. But we know that when we get into March and the weather starts to turn in April, we start to see a 20, 30 percent month over month sales increase. And it happens every year. Compounded with that is the demographic that we normally hire from, which is aged 18 to 23, 24. That's a very normal uh, demographic for entry level positions in restaurants and retail and things like that. Um, the university schedules end, exams are in April. So people are then booking time off to do their exams. And then sometimes they're moving home, they're moving in other places. And so what happens in April every single year is when you drive down the road, every business is hiring. The grocery stores are hiring, McDonald's is hiring, every single business you can think of is all hiring in April. And so what that means is there's fewer people in the labor market because the university students and those of those demographics, they're changing, they're moving. I've had so many people in the past be like, well, I'm actually moving to Australia next month. And I'm like, where did that come from? Because <laughs> um, everyone would tell me in March, oh yeah, we're gonna be staying through the summer, everything's great. Then you get to April and it's like, oh, sorry, no, that changed. And so we have this unexpected turnover every year. And so there's fewer people in the job market, but more jobs available, which means the same thing happens at the job market as what's happening in the housing market in a lot of places right now. Very little supply, a lot of demand means hundreds of thousands of dollars over asking prices for a lot of houses. That's the stuff I'm hearing in, in the Canadian market anyway. And so that just means it is so tough to find people. That means there's fewer applicants. Or if you do get applicants, there are more no shows because by the time they get to your interview, they probably already have a job. Wow. There's so much. And, and has this, has that whole hiring process, or even just that, or just posting different jobs online, mm -hmm. has that changed a lot too through the COVID? Yeah. You know what? Um, not even, I, I wouldn't even say COVID. COVID has definitely changed and sped up some changes, especially from the online market. Um, so when we're looking at that, I was talking to a guy the other day and he said, I post, I post an ad on Indeed and everyone who implied, I told them to come and bring their application in in person. And I was like, okay, so what's the benefit of that? And he says, well, because I get to see them in person, I get to talk to them, I get to you know get a feel for them, see if they might fit, all that kind of stuff. I'm like, great, is that not what an interview is for? It's like, well, I guess you're right. And so he's like, not a single person came into the store. And, and I said two things to him. I said, number one, um, I mean, that's an unnecessary thing to do, but number one, by doing that, you're basically asking someone to go out of their house and then apply in person. You're adding additional step, whereas all the other jobs are available. They might even hire you on the spot. They might not even bring you in for an interview. They are so um, desperate right now. And, and kind of the second thing I said to him was just, you've got to make it easy because right now there's just so much competition. You know, you're just adding an extra exclusion there that doesn't need to be there. And it's not that they don't want to come in. It's just that they don't have to. And why are you making it harder to work for you than it needs to be? So Camille, have you experienced some of this? Oh, well? 100%. I mean, I started working with Andrew a couple of months ago and he was like, well, we're going to get a couple things straight and then we're going to work on hiring. And I was like, yeah, hiring. And now I'm sitting here and I'm like, we have to turn away business because I don't have enough people to work. Um, 
So I'm having to limit my business because I wasn't prepared. Was that a surprise? Um, Yes. And honestly, I wasn't really ready for our restrictions to be lifted so much so quickly. Um, And they were, which is great. I'm glad we get to do things again. Um, And I'm glad people get to celebrate, but I wasn't ready for that. And the moment that the restrictions were lifted, everyone was like, we need cakes. We need to celebrate. Let's have a party. And they came to us and um, I've had to say, I'm so sorry. We can't be a part of this one, but maybe the next one. (laughs) Wow. That's amazing. You know, when you think about it, where we are right now and to look down the road. And I think this is something that I think a lot of operators, we just never been through this. And you see the, you know, the economists are like, well, we really don't even know what the economy is going to look like. We can kind of predict, but it, it's a, it's a very definitely a roller coaster ride right now, especially in Canada with closing and opening, yeah. closing and opening. Um, will that affect the quality of people you get, Andrew, when you're looking for hiring? Is this opening, closing? That we're well, going you, through? you know what, actually, so there, there's two things I want to mention on that. Uh, before to answer that question directly, what Camille is talking about, everyone I speak to is they are basing their hiring decisions and their planning based on where they are today, right? The same way Camille was. And Basically, what we need to do is shift our thinking. Yes, we might be in a lockdown. Sitting in Ottawa, we are at a stay-at-home order. We're not supposed to leave yeah. uh, the house right now. However, I know that four, six, eight weeks from now, that will be different. And so how long is it going to take you to hire people? A couple of weeks. How long is it going to take you to train them? Three, four, five weeks. It's going to be a little bit of time. So realistically, if you started to hire now, you would actually be in a much better place when the restrictions lift. But the problem is most people won't think about that until it's too late and the restrictions are lifting and then they're trying to hire and they're already behind the eight ball. So I tell all of my clients, um, when you need to hire, you're already six weeks, six weeks behind. So we need to shift that thinking a little bit differently. Um, But to answer your question, Jay, what has happened a lot is there are people that have now left the industry altogether because There are also some entry level corporate office jobs, places like that. Um, What they've done now is there's some people in the offices that are on leave because they're staying home with their kids. If they can't um, go to school, we know that obviously schools are now closed in uh, in Ontario for the first little bit anyway, um, hopefully a little bit. Uh, But what's happening is there's people on leave, so they need to fill those positions. So there are other positions that are taking some of the restaurant what's normally been the restaurant industry's bread and butter. So there's fewer people looking for those jobs because who wants to go through and say, okay, we're closed, we're open, we're closed, we're open. Some people are saying, hey, I'm fed up with this. I'm looking for a whole other industry altogether. I need to make a change. And so that has just made it even more difficult if you're not able to retain the team members that you have. Yeah, and that's gotta be hard. Yeah, because you, I think, I, well, obviously before COVID, we were really talking more and more. And a lot, a lot of the lectures that I was doing across Canada, we were even talking about this experience economy. Is that going to factor like the quality that you have around this whole experience? Or are people going to be more open to like the demand, like, like the non, I wouldn't say that that way. Let's try to rephrase that, Jay. Is are they going to be more okay with maybe the servers or the quality that you're producing? Not as the top hundred percent that you can produce. Are they, the is people going to be okay with that? Or is that going to be, um, they're going to be less forgiving, I guess. is what mm. I'm is You know, that's, happen? that's actually a great question. I know Camille, you actually mentioned something along this, whether customers are more forgiving now, now that the restrictions are lessened. So I don't know, maybe you can share a little bit on what you're seeing because you're a little bit ahead of the curve of where of where we are in Canada. Yeah, um, I think people are understanding, especially after what we have all been through in the last year and knowing that, you know, even as a consumer level, you couldn't go to the grocery store and get bread or butter at some point. Um, so I think their understanding of like, if you don't have products because of ordering issues and supply issues, I think they're understanding to that. Um, now, there are some people that have this built up expectation because they haven't had that experience in so long and they haven't Mm -hmm. gone out that they are expecting a level of, you know, perfection to a point. Um, just because, you know, you think about every moment that you've had and, you know, when you think back, it was a great and wonderful experience, even if it wasn't. Um, and they want that again. So I think they're expecting that, but I think they're also understanding if it's not. That's good. That's good. And I'm sure that will be time sensitive in a way. It'll, it'll, yep. A demand for quality and good food and good service will probably ramp up as, yeah. as more as we, you know, I don't want to say get back to normal, but 
yep. as we get back to somewhat the new normal looks like. Yep. Yep. Although I think there will be a, a big shift in the way people do ordering. I think takeout and online ordering, that will still be um, much more prevalent in the time to come. Um, and so a question for, for restaurants is how do we take that same service level and translate that into a very depersonalized environment and that's the question that um that we're asking internally that's a question that um you know i think the whole industry needs to evaluate because how do you create the same service level that you used to in person through personal relationships and human connection how do you do that through a digital environment and i think that's probably one of the the new challenges that we will face in this new normal coming up absolutely so andrew what do you do to help restaurants when you train them and coach them and folks like camille that you've helped. What, what's your processes that you do? Yeah, Shit's magic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't say magic, although I, I, I try. Magic. Um, um, <laughs> you know what? It's it's a it's a great thing. So each, um, in my experience, the clients that I've brought on at least recently um, usually have two major areas of focus. It's either in their internal operations, that being one of the main focuses. So, for example, um, the things aren't getting done the way they should be done. Um, you know, there's a lack of clarity around the training procedures, the operational procedures. Um, how does this order get made and how do you replicate it the same way every time, no matter who's there? Mm -hmm. um, most owners find that they have to be there a lot because if they're not, things start to start to kind of go away. Actually, I was contacted by a, a lady in Australia last night who said um, I had to step away because I had a surgery and I came back and I had lost, you know, half of my regular clients. And now I'm back to working seven days a week and I don't have time to even focus on my health now. So when you don't have the right systems and procedures in place, uh, that's a huge, a huge red flag. And uh, and Camille, that's something that we've worked on just because there's a bunch of different parts of the business. There's a very specific, you know, cake part of it. There's a retail side. And so we just want to make sure everything's clear for everyone so it can be executed and we can hold our teams accountable to the high standards that are going to move our business forward. So that's one part of it. The second piece of it is the people. How do we find the right people? Because I'm sure everyone here, even before COVID, even before the scenario we have now, has had people that they've had a hard time getting them to do the right things or to be the right people. Oh, you know, they have 20 different grandmothers that have passed away somehow and, they, and they're, they you know, constantly calling in or, you yeah. know, not showing up or when they're there, they're on their phones all the time. They're not performing to that level. And the effect that that has on the, you know, the ownership, the management and the solid group of really good employees that have to pick up the slack, that's a huge part. So part of what I help them with is divine. Um, how do we attract the right people? How do we use our interview questions to be able to, to know which one is a good person to hire? Because most of us use our gut feelings like, oh, they were a nice person. I'm going to hire them. But guess yeah. what? Our, our gut feelings change based on our emotions. We're humans. We're emotional. It happens. That's not a system. And I challenge people to think beyond this as well, because most of us got into business to make more and work less. Is that fair to say? Yeah. But most of us end up working more and making more less. So what I try and do is coach my clients into thinking beyond themselves, because maybe you could hire someone great. But then what happens when you pass that on to a manager, when you go to grow to multiple locations and expand mm -hmm. your business, how do you know that they're going to make the same decisions that you would? So your business needs to run on systems, not on you. And I think yeah. that's the biggest thing. The other thing I just want to jump out on that, Andrew, because yeah. you made me think, because I'm going back to when I was running restaurants and hiring people. No one taught us on how to hire people. No, no, absolutely no, were, not. I don't, no, like <laughs> no one really said this is the this is what you should do and this is what you should yep. look for. Um, yeah, you know the, these are the traits you're looking for. That you know you hire on skill or do you hire on attitude? Yep. Like, what should people do then if that's the case? Like. Well, you know what? And that's most of us have learned it by making mistakes. Yeah. And But here's the thing, though. Here's the one thing I want to point out. No matter who I talk to, they often say that they often put the blame on the people. Yeah. Oh, well, they just weren't cut out. So someone quits on you with no notice. Well, they weren't a right fit anyway. They weren't cut out for this. They couldn't handle it. They're a snowflake. Or they're like, I hear all of these things. <laughs> oh, millennials and Gen Z, they're, they can't do it. But yeah. the reoccurring pattern is all of that's happening in your business. Yeah. So what I try and challenge people to think of, you know, yes, there might be issues with all those people, but guess who hired them? 
You did. So yeah. knowing that there's an issue in the system, because you're right, they may be the wrong fit, but you still hired them anyway. So how do we try and predict those things earlier to affect those changes? Because think of it this way. We spend 90% of our HR time on the bottom 10% of our performers. Imagine what you could do wow. if you actually spent the majority of your time on your top performers. Where would your business be if you didn't have to spend all your time just to get your less performing team members up to mediocre? Uh, you're absolutely what if right. that wasn't your focus? I love the right? fact that you say that we actually learn through mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, I have a few, but Camille, did you did you have that too? Did you oh, learn through some of the? I I think I've had the conversation with Andrew that you know I have a business degree and they teach you how to read read a P and L statement, but they don't teach you how to actually run a business. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's been a lot of learning along the way of um, you know people and managing people and learning how to work with them as well as you know when you hire somebody, how do you bring them on correctly so that everything makes sense to them and train them up and that they know who to ask questions to and what questions to ask. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I've got, I've got a, few, I got a story here. I tell you, you're going to laugh on this one. Andrew, sorry, I'm sorry, but <laughs> I, I, I remember running a restaurant and I remember the owner said, well, we got to hire some people. And I put, this is before the internet. Okay. It was a primary area. So it was like, Hey, go get a newspaper ad. You remember those? Mm. When we had the, the, I think there were classifieds in the back. We used to call yeah, them. Yeah. Yeah. And you'd have a job posting. I actually put looking for a funky server. Hmm. Mm. I got some funky servers applying. I tell you, it was very interesting. Yeah. And, and that's just that, that whole thing about not really knowing what to do. Yeah. And then, um, is, is this short term or is this long term? This whole labor problem we're going to go through. Like, how how short do you think this will be? Is this going to get better over one year, six months? Yeah. So you know what? Um, personally, I think, and and uh, I'm not going to put money on this necessarily, but my instinct is that when we get about a month from now, we'll start to see some positive changes. Because that's when the people in that university age demographic who are now shifting their lives, they will now be more settled into where they're going to be. So there will be more applications from that particular age demographic. However, there will still be ongoing effects for the rest of this year. Absolutely. Um, but what I will tell you is that the people challenges, uh, it is easy for everyone to say that the people challenges, oh, it's so bad right now. It's so bad right now. Um, we can't find anyone. And it's easy to blame it all on COVID. But every call I've had with people, I've said, well, hey, did you have people problems before COVID? And they're like, yeah, yeah, I did. So the whole yeah. point is that this has made it 10 times worse. 100% not going to disagree with that. But what I will say is that you probably had hiring issues before. Now they have just been brought to the forefront and you're not able to run your business because there was always a steady stream of the wrong candidates. Now the wrong candidates have been removed from the labor markets because let's face it, the people who are you know, wanting to take advantage of the unemployment supports and not work. Cause we, we hear that yeah. talk all the time. Well, they're too lazy and it's easier to sit at home and mm -hmm. so on. Those aren't the people that you wanted to hire anyway. It just means that now all of the great people are already hired and mm -hmm. you know, now we're fighting them. And then the, the literally there's the wages to pay people. Now that has skyrocketed because there has been an artificial element put in by the government where, you know, to stay home, you can get X amount. And so now we have to raise our pay significantly more um, mm -hmm. because of that. So I believe it'll still be around for the rest of the year to a degree. But here's the thing is when that happens, there's still going to be hiring issues. Um, it won't be as bad. But if there's hiring issues right now, to be honest, there's already things wrong in your process because there probably was last year too. And I think that's the big take home we need to we need to know is that the people side of the business will always be the hardest piece. So you can either learn how to do it better or you can hire robots and self-ordering kiosks. So whichever way you're going to go, um, yeah. yeah, I think those are kind of your two options now. Is there is there an age group that is more like, uh, is an area that restaurateurs should be targeting more? Is it a younger group, older group? Where should you um, be targeting right now if you're looking for hiring people? You know what? Um, that is uh, that's a very loaded question from a legal perspective. I will say that because you can't technically uh, you can't discriminate based on age. So let me no, just say no, that for, no, no, for no. anyone out there, you you cannot ask that in an interview. By the way, um, but what I will what I will say is I've heard just as many um, 
just as many stories of younger people doing it. So I, I hear people, you know, Gen Z or millennials, they don't want to work. They don't have the same work ethic. They, they don't have common sense. They don't have all this. I have found that no matter who it is, I've had people that have been forties and fifties and, and have had the exact same issues. So I would say that there is no such thing as common sense and there is no such thing as um, common knowledge because guess what? Um, what you think might be a stupid mistake is not a stupid mistake to someone who's never made it before. And I think that it gets so easy to actually say, hey, this person's stupid. They, they've made this mistake. Uh, how would they not know how to do this thing? It's so simple. It makes perfect sense for someone who's been doing it as long as you have. And I think that the ultimate cure to a lack of common sense is to have a really great training program. Yeah. And, and you know, that, I'm going to ask you that. Yeah. Cause I yeah. think that that's key. Right. And I think yep. there's so many amazing training programs now that are virtual on your phone. You know, the old days of the 300 page uh, binder that you would ha hand them. Yep. Those days are gone. And uh, which, which is great. Cause I would just, like how many 16 year olds or 18 year olds read a binder of stuff. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I love this subject just because, like I said, it's something that a lot of people just learn from trial and error. And unfortunately yeah. it's so sensitive. Yeah. Uh, you know, we always, you know, you always put these, your business in these people's hands is my mind yeah. and, um, training them, making sure you get the good people. It's a face of your brand. It's a face yeah. of your, of what you're trying to do. And I think it's yeah. so, so, so important that uh, you get the right people. Yeah. And you know what? I, I, I have to add something here because everyone talks about, oh, do you have training videos? Do you have, you know, digital methods of training? Do you have all of these things? And I keep saying to every person, that's only step one. That is mm. only step one. That is communicating the basic information to people. Okay. So how do you assemble a coffee, for example? Sure. You can have a, a training program on that. Hi, Melissa. How's it going? Like your comment. Um, <laughs> So what I would say is that it's step number one. So you can teach someone how to make a coffee, but at the end of the day, you need to then have great management in place to make sure that, okay, you know, let's watch you do it. Let's make sure you're not making those same mistakes. Yep. Let's, uh, let's monitor that all the way through. And, you know, there's so much more to it. So that's step one. And, and that's a great first step. Um, and I find that sometimes companies are using those digital means of training because they are actually putting a bandaid on the problem. And, and I apologize for any digital trainers out there. My view on it is that everyone says, well, we need to have all of this stuff to create consistency, which is great. But I find they often do that so they can skip over a well-trained manager in a sense, yeah. because they don't trust the manager to do the same level of training that they need to and to actually hold people accountable. And great training without accountability and proper management actually isn't going to create the results that you want. So I had to throw that in there because it is a absolutely valid first piece of it, but it yeah. will never replace your in-person management and on-site training. Camille, you agree with that? Oh, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. It's that old saying the hands-on, right? You got a hands-on, yeah. you got to get reviewed by, I, you're bringing back so many memories of just <laughs> all the things I learned over the years running restaurants and, and just yeah. that whole thing. If, and, and, it, and I really believe that age group that primarily is in your restaurant that are the servers and the chefs and everyone else that you have in your, in your brigade or in your staffing, they really seek that. I find mm -hmm. is that yep. feedback, yeah. especially in the yep. younger generations. They like hearing it. They like yep. that constant improvement, you know, that, that feedback for improvement. Um, I find it so it, it feels good in a way too. And, and I also believe that the rhythm of doing that needs to be consistent. Yep. Um, not just once in a while or off. Yeah. You need to be on top of that, providing that. And that's great leadership as to what Melissa yeah. was saying. Um, great leadership within your, and within your restaurants. I find the most successful restaurants that I've ever worked with are the ones that have an amazing leader Yeah, and the leadership mindset within that whole organization. Yeah. Those so are the ones. You Jay, um, do you know what the number one piece of feedback coming up from employees is? What is that? I don't have a clue. Uh, that they want more feedback. 
They want more feedback. Yeah. <laughs> that's li- literally, that's the number one that they want to oh. know how they're doing. They want to know how they can improve. And and I hear so many people saying that, you know, oh, you know, my people, they suck or they they don't want to do anything or they don't do any of that. I mean, I would say two things. One, you might have the wrong people or two, you might not actually be challenging them enough yeah. because we know it. Even us being, you know, high performing individuals, Camille being amazing. We have the best cakes I've ever seen in my in my life. And I'm kind of getting hungry after looking at her Instagram. But um, the whole <laughs> point is, is that even she and I and you um, yeah. will need someone to hold us accountable as well. Naturally, we might be pushing that 90 percent of our capacity um, on our own. But to eke out that little bit yeah. of extra, you do need a little bit of accountability and your team members do as well. So. I would say that 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 is the biggest piece of feedback. And and just to go back on something else that you said as well, um, you know, who we should be targeting. I I learned this in a podcast. I I can't remember which one, but I always look for people with PhDs that are poor, hungry and determined. Um, And the reason I do that is because here's the thing. I always believe in promoting internally in my organizations. And I say, how do we take someone from an entry level employee, recruit the ones that have the diamond in the rough and then train them up to be the leaders that we know they can be. That's a big part of what I do. And for them, I absolutely love seeing the the growth. But I believe if you take the right person and you give them the right opportunity, just get out of their way and see what yeah. they can do with it. And I've, I've never been disappointed uh, with that model. Um, nearly as much as trying to bring people in um, from the outside. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's just a little, little. And, and that would be, is that very similar? That's all, uh, exactly kind of that same thing of hiring people with experience or no experience. Yep. Right. Camille, like, hire, yeah, the, hire the person here. And we started out on a dishwasher. She'd get all of her tasks done before her shift ended. She'd go, okay, what else can I learn? And so now we've been able to bring her into the decorating side and also teach her some cashier duties and cross train her. And she's just been rocking my world. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the person you need to hire. That's the person you need to find in your process. And then once you find that person, like there's an old saying that we used to use in the business, which was, you know, I can teach someone how to make a sandwich, but I can't teach someone how to smile. And so you're hiring that person and then training these skills that go along with it. And I think that that is a really under um, underserved piece of advice that I think would help a lot of people. Yeah. And I, and I, I truly believe that. I truly believe in that as well is you just can't, you just, you just can't wire them in a way when they come in the interview and you can see they're excited to be there. And like you said, Camille about, I want to be here. Um, it's amazing because I think the big thing also, I just want to bring up too, uh, before we wrap up here is, and I, I, I saw this in one of Anthony Bourdain's post the other day, uh, just something that he posted out there about uh, something about the misfits. Uh, you know, the restaurant industry is really bringing the misfits together and stuff. And so she in the, in the kitchen. Um, and I love that, but it is the thing that what when he said that it, it reminds me of the the that you create a family of who you work with in this industry, right? And you're so tied in. And as owners and operators, you kind of get to select who's in that family yep. through your process. And I remember one of my managers like a zillion years ago was he, he always referenced like, um, would I be good with them for a full day in a boat? And, uh, you know, yeah. if I'm going to hire them, you're going to sit in a boat all day with them, or am I going to want to throw them over after a while? <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, we don't get to pick our families, but we definitely get to pick who we, uh, who we have on board to support yeah. our businesses. And uh, you create a family and you create a bond. And, um, I've been through that and it's amazing too. It, it, it feel it's amazing. And the feelings you get for that bond in that family and, and Camille, you probably have this as well. Uh, your, your people, your family, right? Yeah, 100%. I spend more time with them than I do at home. So <laughs> <laughs> It's so true, right? It's yeah. so yeah. true. So, um, Well, Jay, Andrew, sorry, do you want to go through some more stuff here? Yeah, actually, what I, what I was going to suggest is I just, you know, quickly, I would love to just give people some quick tips and tricks on how to hire yep. in this environment. And then yep. um, Camille, who has been doing some of it, can, can share her experience if that's cool. Let's go for it. All right. So just very quickly, the biggest thing you need to do to hire in this environment right now, everyone's doing all the same things they used to do. So what you need to do is treat your hiring like you treat your marketing. So instead, you know, we put our best creative out, our best words, our best offers for all of our marketing to drive new customers in. But some 
reason, we actually take our hiring and say, well, must be energetic, must be able to live 50 pounds, uh, must be available this time, this time, and tell them all the reasons they shouldn't apply. Where very few people say, hey, why should you work someplace? And here's the thing we need to know about Gen Z and millennials is they want to actually do meaningful work. So how can you like what's different about your restaurant and your business? What about working for that is meaningful? How can they contribute something bigger than themselves? Because the offer of just a job is not enough because right now there's a hundred jobs that need people. So how can you attract the best? And that's the question that we ultimately have to ask and think about it, you know, even from the perspective of your job ad, the title of your job ad, server wanted, that's just like a hundred other job ads that are out there and titles, right? Mm -hmm. So how can you, literally have that be unique enough and a call to action enough that will sell someone reading the ad. And then how can you make your ad sell the interview? And then how do you make your communications between the application and interview? How can you sell that interview to reduce your no-show rate? And then during the interview, how can you sell the position so people are actually competing to work for you instead of the other way around? And actually, I had someone comment on my Facebook that it was not even a client. They're like, I've just been reading your stuff and I did this and now people are fighting to work in my restaurant. And I was like, imagine what you could do if you actually worked with me. Um, <laughs> so that's the thing we have to think about in this market right now. You have to hire. You have to hire continually. You have to uh, make sure you're getting people in for interviews within 24 to 48 hours. You need to do it quick because there are more no-shows the longer you go. And ultimately we need to stand out because everyone's doing the same thing. So what you need to do is stand out about the rest the same way you'd want your marketing to stand out from the rest. So what makes your restaurant unique and why should someone wanna work there? And if you lead with that, you're gonna have a much better chance differentiating yourself. So Camille, I know you've implemented some of that. So, so tell us how it's going. Yeah, it's going really well. We used to just have like an application form online on our website that people would just fill at any time. And if I saw someone great, I'd be like, hey, yeah, we should, could probably use somebody right now. Um, but I recently set out a job on Indeed instead of just saying cashier, I said customer service all-star. And we've actually gotten feedback from some of the people that we've interviewed. They're like, honestly, I applied just because of the description, just because it was different than just saying, we want you to do this. You have to do this. This is your requirement. This is, you know, this is what we're expecting from you. And instead just saying like, this is why you should work here. And this is your purpose and our goal um, to be a part of the team. And I mean, we normally got, if we had to fill a position, we put it out there, we might get five applicants using this different technique. I had a zoom meeting with Andrew for maybe an hour and we, I was like, Oh my gosh, we just got eight more applicants just in an hour, let alone <laughs> my other applicant, other systems, just like four or five people. Like it's nuts. Yeah. Very yeah. cool. So it is possible in this market to actually have some success with hiring. And the key is that we have to do things differently because it's so much more competitive now. Um, we have to do things differently so you can stand out from the rest. I think that's probably the biggest piece um, to take away from today is when things get tougher, we need to adapt. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Love that tip. Love that tip. And it's so true. So true. I have a daughter looking for a job right now. And the same thing is you go through it with her and it's the same. You're exactly right. It's that server wanted, cashier wanted, cook wanted, right? Yeah, I never thought of it that way, but that's or a cool. sign up in the door. Like <laughs> exactly. You know? yeah. Like who does that anymore? Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I apologize if you do. Let's talk. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We can help you. Yeah. Andrew can help you. Awesome stuff. Other tips? Oh, I mean, I could go on for hours, but I mean ultimately, like I think those are probably the biggest ones. Um one other one that I think would help wherever you're posting it, don't post it once. It's not a set it and forget it thing. It's a every day you need to be out there because there's new applicants coming to the job market every day. And so therefore you're just trying to get any new entrance every day. So you need to post it multiple times, multiple platforms. Um, I like to say that, you know, when we're posting ads, it should almost be like we threw up on the job board. Like you, like we just wanted to be everywhere. And, uh, and that's how we do our hiring. Cause we have to make sure like if you are, what's the, uh, what's the old saying? Like, if you're not, um, if you're not memorable, you're forgettable. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the same thing from, from job ads, we need to take that attention somehow. So we've got to, mm -hmm. we've got to get out there. We've got to do it often. And, uh, within a day you could be on page 10 of all the new jobs that have come out there. That's everybody's hiring right now. Um, Absolutely. So what about yeah. social? 
I see a lot of people posting yep. jobs on social platforms. Yep. Not just job like Indeed and stuff. Yep. I see it on LinkedIn. We're hiring. I see it on uh, yep. Instagram recently. Is that a recommend? Is that a good place to do that, or should you stick to mm. those sites? So the question I ask when someone ever says, "Hey, um, I'm going to put a job ad on Facebook," I say, "Great. Who are you targeting with that? Who are your ideal employees, and where do they go?" And so for most people, they're like, oh, well, they're always on Instagram and TikTok and Snapchat. I'm like, okay, so then is posting that job ad on Facebook going to do you any good? And they're like, oh, yeah, no, that makes sense. However, you might actually get people's parents on, on Facebook or, you know, like that that is possible. So, I mean, it could definitely be worthwhile, but I always think the same way we're targeting our marketing. If your ideal client is someone who is uh, a family, for example, if that's who you're trying to bring into your restaurant, um, you would go where your families go. You would look for those specific areas and those markers that would help target them. You need to do the same thing when you're looking for employees as well. Who are you targeting and how do you get in front of them where they're at? So social could definitely be a, a great place. And even when it comes to different job sites, some people say, well, I, I did it on Kijiji or, or this place or that place. And I asked them the same question, where are people looking for jobs in your area? And ask your current employees, where are their friends looking for jobs? And go there because you need to get in front of the right people because you could have the best offer, the best ad copy, like the best job ad copy. You could have the best job ad title, but if no one sees it, it's not going to matter. So you've got to go in front of the people and get it where it needs to go. Uh, video ads about jobs in your location. Have you seen those? I've seen a few of those. I mean, I've done a few of those in the past. I usually send them a video of like, hey, you should work here because it's like a minute uh, minute video. I send that after they apply in between that and the interview. So I've done that before. Um, but you know what? Yeah, it's, I mean, whatever whatever is going to attract people, that's what you've got to do. Um, find out what your ideal employee is looking for, what kind of benefits, what kind of um, salary, what kind of, like what's important to them as I've heard people say, well, we give, you know, health benefits and we give this and, you know, most of the people they were trying to bring on and hire live at home and are covered under their parents' plan. So therefore that wasn't really relevant for them. So, you know, what is it that's actually going to make a difference for the people you're trying to attract? We have to, instead of thinking this about this from what we need, we have to think about what will attract them. It's a totally different shifted uh, frame of reference now. Awesome stuff. Awesome. Yeah. It's just so valuable. So valuable. So hopefully everyone took something from this today that or we're going to watch this later or yep. tune in today when they did. And I just can't thank you both enough. Like this is just awesome. Yeah. This is great advice. And this will help a lot of restaurants as we get through where we are right now in this yep. fall and spring and summer or well, this summer and fall, I believe is going to be nuts. And uh, we're hoping all the best. So I yeah. just thank you both for attending today's show. Yeah. And uh, if anyone's interested as well, I actually have a restaurant hiring playbook, absolutely free. Um, I can send Jay the link, but you can download it. It has literally the job ad that's gotten hundreds of applicants for multiple clients, even has sample interview questions, just literally everything that you need to know to succeed in this job market, absolutely free. So I will, uh, I will send over that link and uh, yeah, have at it. And you hopefully more uh, information at your website too, right? We have it oh, going across the bottom there. Perfect. Perfect. Right. And then uh, I just can't thank you both enough. And, awesome. Um, Camille, thank you again. All the best down there as Thanks. you guys get back to the new normal. And uh, you guys are going to be busy, I know, for the what's going on and how you guys are a little ahead of us down there. So all the best to you. And thanks again for spending time today with us. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity awesome. to the both of you. Awesome. Excellent. Well, thanks again. And everyone else, you know what today is, by the way, just both of you, it's in, in Canada, it's National Takeout Day. So today is April 15th. It's National Takeout Day today. So you want to make sure you go and support restaurants. I'm going to do a triple takeout day, meaning <laughs> breakfast for my daughter upstairs and, and my kids. And then I'm going to do lunch. And then we're going to do dinner. We're doing a triple takeout day. So nice. support our restaurants, especially the places that are closed. You can't dine in. Takeout day yeah. is important today in Canada. And uh, everyone get out there and support them. So. And next week, we're back more again, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Every week, we're live um, right here. But thanks again, both of you and everyone else that tuned in. Have a great rest of your day and go get some takeout and uh, support your restaurants. They need us. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Jay. All right. Take care. Bye.